Okay, just wanted to uh, let everybody know. And uh, the only way you can stop the recording, as I understand it, is to leave the meeting. So um, anyway, uh, uh, so if you all hit the little continue button, uh, then you will uh, continue with the meeting. Um, which I guess uh, uh, sort of implies that you are okay with the idea of this being recorded. Um, so if you attended our March forum on hydrogen, uh, you will know that I've become pretty interested in uh, alternatives to carbon-based energy for some time. And so before introducing our speaker, I'd like to take a few minutes to share some things I've learned about energy in Oregon, mostly from Google research. I hope this will add some context to tonight's program. Um, last year, uh, the Department of Energy of Oregon published this fabulous document on energy production and consumption in our state. Although it's over 600 pages long, you can skip around by clicking on different topics in the table of contents. It's free and available online, and I'll send out an email link to everyone who's registered for this forum. Um, this uh, diagram uh, is from, the, uh, from this report, 2020 report. And um, it shows where all of our energy in Oregon comes from, uh, what kind of energy there is, uh, and how it's being used currently. And as you can see here, we produce about a third of our energy locally, and about two thirds of it uh, comes from elsewhere, from other places around the United States or perhaps uh, in the world. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this imported energy is uh, by and large uh, derived from burning carbon. So uh, petroleum that runs our cars and natural gas that uh, helps us generate electricity and uh, heats our homes and uh, powers our industries, accounts for about uh, two thirds. The one third that we produce uh, here locally uh, is dominated by hydropower, which as you well know, it about, uh, uh, constitutes about a half of our electrical energy production. Um, so this is the kind of information you can get from this report and it's fun to kind of study this uh, uh, diagram. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that this big segment of energy down here, the energy that we import and that's largely carbonaceous, is someday got to be replaced by something else. And so we need lots of help. Right now, we're getting some help from wind and solar, but altogether, in terms of the whole energy uh, makeup, that's still only at about 5%. So, um, uh, we are certainly uh, excited by the uh, generation of wind. Uh, we see those big turbines on the Columbia River Valley. And uh, this really got uh, built up starting in about 2007 uh, to uh, do to this point where we are at today. But as you can see, lately it's been kind of leveling off. And so we need to think of where else maybe we could find some strong winds. Um, but in any case, these are our current uh, sources of clean energy in Oregon, hydro, onshore wind, solar. So, uh, but, you know, could someday Oregon become a real clean energy powerhouse? What are the potentials in our state for clean energy? And I'm going to just mention a, a few things about offshore wind and geothermal, and we'll, our main focus tonight will be on uh, ocean energy. Um, but where could we find some offshore wind? Well, as it turns out, uh, the southern coast down by Reedsport has some of the strongest winds uh, in the United States. Uh, and so there's been interest for some time in trying to develop this. Um, and uh, uh, currently, uh, wind turbines, of course, are mostly on land. And, and uh, in order to obtain some energy from this, these strong ocean winds, uh, we have to mount them on some kind of raft. And this artist uh, uh, portrayal here shows the kind of thing uh, that would be needed. Uh, the thing about it is the, 
uh, coastline down in Southern Oregon drops off rather abruptly. And so it's not possible to bolt those wind turbines down to the floor of the ocean like they do on the east coast of the US or over in Europe. So uh, offshore wind will require a whole different technology and it's still in development, but um, it has come a ways. These are some actual uh, uh, wind turbines floating in the ocean off of the coast of Portugal, and I, I, as I recall, and um, these are operative. So uh, it may not be too far away. We can do this sort of thing. These guys are big. This is an individual standing on top of one of these uh, turbines. Uh, the, the bigger you make them, the more efficient they are in general. So that's why they're so gigantic. Um, and uh, the uh, current administration is uh, looking to promote wind energy uh, and uh, just announced recently that uh, there's cooperation between the governor of California, Mr. Newsom, and the, and the uh, federal government to try to find uh, new areas for wind far farms uh, just south, actually, of the Oregon border. Um, and in fact, uh, recently, um, a floating offshore wind power bill passes the Oregon House. This is basically a provision that would uh, set up a, um, a, uh, a task force to at least explore the development of three gigawatts of wind power off the Oregon coast by 2030. So uh, hang on your hats. Uh, wind may be coming our way on the uh, Oregon coast uh, um, one of these days. Uh, another uh, Oregon possible uh, source of energy is geothermal. Uh, this would be an example, a diagram of how a geothermal power plant could work. There's a, there's a huge amount of hot rocks down below the surface of the earth here, as you well know, sometimes expressing itself as a geyser, such as in Yellowstone Park. But you can make an artificial geyser in a sense by injecting water down into those hot rocks and then uh, collecting the steam that's generated uh, uh, on uh, up to the surface to run a turbine to turn a generator and to produce electricity. Uh, this sort of uh, power plant uh, has been built in Iceland and in other places in the, in the world. Uh, we don't really have anything much of this sort. We have a few things uh, that have been uh, artificially these what you might call artificial geysers in the U.S., but uh, have yet to, to really uh, develop this very far. Um, but uh, the Newberry Crater, or Caldera, I guess is the right term, um, near just south of Bend, Oregon, is one of the uh, most promising sites for uh, geothermal in the country. And uh, you can see here the craters and the lava flow the, uh, the reason for this uh, potential is that the, uh, the hot rocks are not so far down, although they're, they're a ways. Um, the uh, recent, well, over the last few years, experiments have been done in which uh, uh, wells have been drilled down several miles and have found uh, rocks that exceed 600 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, this, this may be another way that Oregon could uh, produce more of our own energy someday. Um, and um, although it seems uh, pretty logical in, in terms of uh, the concept, uh, there's a lot of research and, and uh, efforts need to be done to actually bring this about. Although there are some uh, 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 reports such as this one that I found that uh, there are people that believe that this geothermal energy is is poised for a big breakthrough. Perhaps when the oil industry uh, can't drill any more oil wells, they'll take their equipment and start drilling holes in the ground for geothermal. So that uh, brings us to uh, tonight's uh, uh, program. And uh, uh, I guess this picture is just to emphasize that uh, it's pretty rough out there on the ocean. And uh, uh, we need a some kind of a laboratory setting to really be able to work out the technology uh, for uh, converting wave energy to electricity. And that's what uh, Dr. Hales is going to help us with tonight. Uh, 
And uh, we would like to thank him very much for taking time out from his busy schedule to, uh, to provide this information for us. Um, uh, Dr. Hales um, is, uh, who grew up in the Columbia Basin in Eastern Washington and graduated from the University of Washington in 1988 with a BS in chemical engineering, obtained a PhD in uh, chemical oceanography in 1995, and then was a postdoctoral fellow for two years at Columbia University in New York before joining the OSU College of Earth's Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences in 1998. He considers himself an observational carbon cycle oceanographer using observational and computational tools that he developed uh, to see and understand the ocean in novel ways. I hope I did carry that uh, part of the uh, introduction out well. Uh, to carry out his research, he sailed on all the major oceans in the world with over 700 days on the sea. So uh, with that, I will uh, let uh, Dr. Hales take over the program. Well, thanks very much, Bob. And thanks everyone for, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, let me queue up my slide deck here. Anyone give me a thumbs up on that screen? Is that visible for everybody? Yeah, looks good. Great. All right. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm I'm here to tell you uh, mostly about Packwave, which is this test facility that we're in the in the midst of building. We started construction about a week and a half ago, almost two weeks ago. Um, but I know that uh, that's a little challenging uh, sometimes to to talk about just the infrastructure itself, and so I will spend some time talking about the the conceptual ideas about how uh, wave energy can be harvested and turned into uh, electricity or other forms of energy. Uh, and and Bob, uh, Bob asked me to uh, include some some statements, some slides about uh, the impact of, of wave energy on, on social justice, equity, inclusion, uh, diversity, et cetera. Um, I put those slides at the end, Bob, uh, and uh, I, I'm hoping that's all right. I think they might make a little more sense after talking about wave energy and, and yeah, you know, how it's differentiated from some of the other green energies. Uh, okay, so why wave energy? Well, it, it turns out it's it's a, a large uh, potential energy source. Uh, we think it's um, we think it's capable of generating about ten percent of the global electricity demand. Um, and there are a number of other things you can do with wave energy without necessarily going the step of converting to electricity. But that's where most of the focus is. Um, most of this energy is along the coastlines. Uh, waves get really energetic when they interact with, with the, the seashore uh, as the continental shelf rises and, and starts to make, make waves uh, increase in amplitude and, and uh, frequency and, and start to break. Um, the really great thing about ocean energy in comparison to other kinds of green energy is that they're, they're sort of the low and slow uh, hair to the rabbit of uh, solar or wind. Uh, the waves are pretty much always going. Um, there are obviously fluctuations, but you know the waves don't set when the sun sets. There's still energy uh, in waves when there's no energy locally available from the sun. Waves will even continue when the wind isn't blowing. Um, and so the waves are this effective capture of, of green energy sources to the ocean that are then radially transported out to the to the coastlines where where that energy can be captured and harvested. Uh, U.S. Department of Energy, they're our prime funder. They're the prime motivator for this. Uh, they've got a large office associated with renewable energy uh, and a large office within that that's associated with uh, what we're calling marine kinetic energy, uh, uh, marine hydrokinetic energy. Um, and there are a couple of different forms of that. There's energy that you can harvest uh, in ways that we, we refer to as run of river. So rather than uh, putting a dam in a river, you put a, an energy harvesting device that will generate rotational motion, uh, much like a fishing lure spins when it's in the current. Uh, without damming up the river, uh, there's tidal energy uh, in areas where you've got restricted waterways and, and tidal activity. You can capture that energy similarly. Uh, we, PackWave is very, very focused on open ocean surface waves, so not tides and, and not currents. 
you're to look at uh, the marine energy resources around uh, the U.S., there's are there are large uh, resources in, on the West Coast, uh, maybe a third of the a little over a quarter of the the total uh, contiguous U.S. Uh, resources, uh, and all of the West Coast resources are very close to shore. A significant uh, chunk of the the East Coast resources are far offshore. Uh, Hawaii is far offshore. The the Alaskan uh, research, Alaskan and Hawaiian resources are much less sort of accessible to established electricity grids and, and ports. So the West Coast is a really great uh, great place to focus this kind of work. So Oregon uh, is fairly unique in in this regard because it's got the kind of the perfect synergy between energetic waves and a reasonably accessible uh, and energized coastline. So if any of you have done uh, vacation drives up the Washington coast, uh, for example, uh, Oregon's coast is much more accessible. We've got better deep water ports. We've got better uh, coastal infrastructure, better grid connectivity. Uh, I just did a, a trip for another job up in Forks, Washington, and there was a long, long period of uh, not much going on, not much cellular, uh, not, not, really any meaningful deep water access to the ocean off the Washington coast. And it doesn't get better when you go further north. When you start to go south into California, the wave resource starts to drop in comparison to Oregon. So we've got this, this really nice combination of an energetic resource and, and the infrastructure and, and supply chain to deal with it. Um, and on, on top of that, we're, we've spent uh, a long time, a couple of decades working with the Oregon coastal stakeholders uh, to establish a procedure for siting test facilities, for making sure that we're working with the communities. Um, and so that's been really fantastic. Uh, you talked about the, the offshore wind uh, energy uh, program down on the South Coast. That effort has been really plagued by uh, local stakeholder resistance to that effort. Uh, and, and we have not run into similar, similar issues with the, the fishing and, and coastal communities that we've worked with. Uh, on top of that, uh, OSU is a, an important research institution, maybe the leading research institution in studying and, and harnessing wave energy. Um, uh, one of the few places in the, in the United States where wave energy testing has actually been done. Um, and since, yeah, since the early 2000s, maybe late 90s, uh, the, the research and development teams in engineering and, and uh, oceanography have been working hard on, on trying to figure out how this works. Uh, test labs, uh, test facilities on shore for scaled down device testing. Um, number of the active companies, uh, Columbia Power, Ock Harmonics, uh, 3M Wave, actually came from OSU. These were students in, in our engineering programs that created companies and spun off. Uh, we've done a couple of large scale, not full scale, but large scale uh, successful deployments of wave energy converters that WEC uh, stands for wave energy converter. You'll hear me use that acronym frequently. Um, and we produced a huge number, uh, nearly 100 PhD and master's students since the inception. Uh, and these, these graduates are being snapped up and, and hired by energy companies, supply chain companies, national labs, and other universities. Um, many, many uh, different projects, many different devices tested at, uh, at Oregon State in these scaled facilities. Uh, I alluded to this earlier, but the, the coastal stakeholders really like wave. Um, they like solar a lot. They like wind a lot, sort of until it gets in their backyard. Uh, but they're, they're very happy with wave, uh, happier than they are with geothermal or hydro uh, or, or the, the, more, uh, the less renewable options, natural gas, nuclear, and coal. Um, and so we've, we've got a really a great environment where the community likes us, the resource is good, the access to it is good. We've got the proximity of the, the leading research institution in the world to work on this. Uh, I think that restates what I said, uh, but it, it really doesn't seem to be very partisan. The, the liberals and the conservatives seem to like us, and and uh, and that's really a nice feature. We don't we don't seem to be running into huge issues when we get outside of the very blueness of uh, of a town like Corvallis and start working on the coast. Okay, so how do you do it? Well, because of the absence of test facilities, the ideas about how wave energy is captured are um, scattered, diffuse diverse. There are a number of ways of, of looking at it, but 
there are many, many designs that, that can, in theory, capture the oscillatory motion of the waves and turn it uh, either uh, by generating rotation or generating uh, compression, either hydraulic or, or pneumatic, driving turbines, driving hydraulic uh, systems um, <clears throat> with uh, asymmetric pendulums that will that will result in rotation, uh, lots and lots of ways of, of doing this. And, and ultimately, when you're talking about uh, producing electrical energy, we, we are ultimately in some way or another producing motion of magnets relative to coils. Uh, and, and many of the things that we're doing uh, are almost as envisionable in terms of thinking about day-to-day -day, uh, devices that we're familiar with, uh, maybe even child's toys. So I'm sure someone in this audience has had a yo-yo that would light up when you spun it. So when it spun within that yo-yo, there were magnets and coils that would charge capacitors that would power a little, a little light in the yo-yo. And a number of these devices, as the buoy moves up and down with the waves, it retracts and, and, uh, and spins uh, flywheels that will, that will generate electricity. Um, some of these devices, this one here that sort of looks like a segmented snake uh, that you might see at a, a curio shop in, the, on, in one of the coastal boardwalks, uh, at every one of these segments, where's my cursor? At every one of these segments uh, on this snake, there's a motion, uh, an inductive generation of power at every segment. Uh, some of these devices, um, this one here, uh, acts sort of like a... Uh, uh, self-winding watch. Uh, and so every time this one tips and rolls, there's a, a little asymmetric flywheel that moves and spins in there. Um, this one pumps water into hydraulic systems. Uh, this one uh, compresses air and blows it out through a turbine here. So lots and lots of different ways of, of producing wave energy. And we've got sort of um, broad categories of, of devices. Point absorbers, this idea of a buoy that moves up and down and spins and, and uh, retracts a, a winch or a, a, a generator that spins, uh, that, that would be a point absorber. An attenuator uh, would be one of these devices that lies on the surface of the ocean and, and moves uh, relative to itself. Uh, oscillating water column are these devices where the, the wave uh, crashes into a hollow chamber within the device and compresses air and runs it up through a stack. It's actually very similar to what happens at uh, Devil's Punch Bowl at uh, Otter Rock. There's an opening uh, at the coast uh, out towards the ocean, and then there's a small hole there inshore. And when the wave comes in and compresses that air, it shoots out like a geyser into the top, out of the top of that. And, and effectively, if you were to think about putting a turbine over the top of that, that compression of the air would drive that turbine, which would spin uh, a magnet or a coil, one relative to the other. A number of these devices have uh, linear actuators. If you think about a blackout flashlight uh, that you shake, um, and charges itself when, when a magnet slides up and down relative to the coil and the flashlight. Most of these are, are, are driven by this concept and they're just different ways of capturing that, that material. Um, this is a wave surge device. So you've got uh, essentially a, a flapper on a, on a fulcrum that goes back and forth and you could envision down in here, you've got opposing pistons like a Subaru engine going back and forth and, and uh, driving power there. This is sort of a, a mock-up of this. This is a device made by Resolute Marine Energy that has been, I don't know if it currently is, but it has been deployed at uh, Camp Rylea uh, up near Astoria. Uh, every time a wave goes over, this height difference of the water column causes a pressure differential and you can actually drive devices up and down in that regard, or you can do it with uh, diaphragms uh, that capture that energy in, in that way. Um, this is the point absorber that we talked about where, uh, sorry, I just got the notice that the, uh, my, my cursor is not readily visible. So I'm talking, I'm pointing up here at this uh, 2000 aqua ret point absorber. This is the up and down sort of yo-yo style device that moves up and down with the, with the waves. Uh, this device over here in the upper, upper right uh, is a device created by Columbia Power, uh, who's actually headquartered here in Corvallis. These arms uh, across this space here, every time the wave moves, they rotate back and forth. And this is very much like the, uh, the self-winding watch concept. Uh, this is, uh, I think this was called the, the, Palam the Palamas Dragon down here in the lower right. This is one of these segmented snakes. And every time a wave comes through, 
and the segments move relative to each other, that motion can be turned into electrical potential and, and captured. Uh, this is the, uh, the Wello Penguin, and it's a, a device that, uh, this is the upper left that I'm pointing to here. The, this device has an asymmetric flywheel within it. And every time the device rocks, the heavy side of the flywheel falls and then it rocks back and the heavy side of the flywheel falls the other way and it, it starts to build a, an oscillatory a resonance and continue to rotate. Uh, down here at the bottom, this is an oscillating water column device. Uh, this device down here in the lower right is the ocean energy buoy that was actually fabricated in uh, Vigor shipyards in Portland. Uh, and every time the waves come in and force this water column, this captured water column up and down, you drive a turbine that's in the exhaust of that system. And the, the devices are rectified in such a way that you can capture energy on both the exhaust and the, the uh, ingress uh, spin. So the, the turbine will spin in one direction when it's compressed and another direction when it's evacuated, but they still produce energy in both directions. Here's the, the ocean energy device at, at Vigor. And you know you get a sense of what's going on here. These are cherry picker devices uh, down here. And so this is a huge device. Let's see if I can get the, the video to play. A drone video of this thing, but these are, these are huge. These are, you know, here's, here's people down here. This is as big as a, you know, bigger than probably most of our homes. Uh, huge, huge devices to be maneuvered and, and assembled. Uh, <clears throat> there at, at the Vigor shipyard. When this was ultimately assembled, it was uh, launched into the Columbia River there and then towed across the ocean to Hawaii, where there's a, a naval uh, test site that's sort of a precursor to the PacWave site that I'll talk about more. Uh, I did the calculation. Uh, they towed the, the device at about a brisk walking pace. And so they, they took it across, across the ocean to Hawaii in about the amount of time it would have taken us to walk that far, uh, assuming that we can all walk on water. The devices I've talked about so far have been primarily large uh, utility scale devices that produce uh, electricity that's ultimately destined for a grid, uh, like the like the local grid. Uh, the grid that we'll interface with is the Central Lincoln People's Utility District grid. Uh, but that's not the only thing that can happen. Uh, isolated systems uh, that can serve just a community, a small community, are very important. Uh, devices that don't necessarily even produce electricity, but use the energy, the hydraulic energy and reverse osmosis to do desalination. Uh, you could do desalination at a, a remote location in the open ocean and ships could stop and recharge with fresh water. Uh, you can make ice out there. So if you imagine our, our hate fleet that sits at the, at the shelf break most summers, being able to replenish with ice and not have to send in the, the supply boats as, as frequently, they're you know, uh, uh, ampli amplified energy savings associated with being able to produce this kind of energy locally. Um, Autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, devices that are, you know, listening for whales, listening for earthquakes, things like that. If they can just stay out in the ocean all the time without having to come back in to have batteries changed, that's a huge uh, advantage. Uh, persistent observation and navigation systems, navigation buoys, weather buoys, those sorts of things. Uh, data centers. Um, when when I was visiting one of the wave facilities in Europe, uh, Microsoft had just been there. Microsoft, Google, Google had just been there. Uh, and built a huge data vault on the sea floor um, and were able to capture the wave energy right there and also produce, you know, dissipate the heat associated with the, the computational power that they needed by being in a, a stable, a thermally stable environment. Um, disaster resiliency and recovery, you think about uh, Puerto Rico uh, and, and what happened to Puerto Rico after the, after the hurricane. What did, they, what did they lack? Well, they lacked refrigeration, they lacked fresh water. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that will you know, keep the, the add-on effects of disaster minimized. Medicines don't go bad. Uh, people aren't drinking contaminated water. Um, aquaculture, many of the, the forward-looking aquaculture plans are, are intended to be out in the open ocean. If you can uh, provide uh, oxygenation, uh, fr flushing of water through your, your tanks, uh, disposal of waste, those sorts of things based on wave energy. It's a big plus. 
people talk about mining. I think that's a, a longer way away uh, than than suggested, um, but it's it is a possibility. Um, uh, waterways you could actually build uh, uh, pelagic uh, harbors out in the in the open ocean that would be powered largely by wave energy. Uh, and then this one down here at the bottom, shoreline protection, is one of my favorites. We spend a huge amount of money and time and resources building wave dissipation systems, jetties, dikes, that sort of thing, to break the waves before they come in uh, to the harbors. And then we spend a huge amount of energy continually dredging and, and scouring out the sand that wants to settle in these low energy environments. If you rather than building just a wave break, you build a wave capture system. And in that wave capture system, you develop uh, the capability to pump water and you pump that water out your, your, uh, your waterway and continually scour away the sand that wants to sit there. That's, that's capturing the, the energy avoiding bringing in vessels that are burning fossil fuel, avoiding, uh, uh, potentially shutting down jetties for periods while you're doing while you're doing dredging um, and and basically keeping your harbors and and your your operations going without a, an added energy cost. Okay, so marine energy at OSU um, been doing this for a long time. Uh, I think this might be a duplicate slide. Been doing this for a long time. Lots of PhDs, spin-off companies, uh, lots of uh, scaled facilities. We'll talk a little more about this. Um, and, and we're engaged uh, with a, a consortium that we're calling the, the Pacific Marine Energy Center that involves us, the University of Washington, who focuses largely on tidal energy, and the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which focuses largely on run of river uh, current energy. Within OSU, we've got... Uh, uh, essentially four test facilities. This system here, this, this facility here is called the Wallage, the Wallace Energy Systems and, and uh, uh, Research Renewable Facility um, where people study the, the types of devices. Sorry, I'm losing my cursor here. Study the types of devices that will actually convert that wave motion into rotational motion that can, that can produce power. Uh, the Hinsdale Wave Research Laboratory, where this is a very popular tour destination on campus. We've actually got tanks where we make waves, uh, and and we have uh, you know student projects that are involved with building mock-ups of coastal towns. There's been a, a mock-up built, I, I believe, of the community of Seaside uh, on the Oregon coast, uh, and we built this mock-up, and then we made a fake tsunami and looked at which construction types were resilient and which weren't. Um, autonomous testing. This happens at our non-cabled site called Pack Wave North, and then our grid-connected testing facility that I'll talk about today, which is Pack Wave South. Okay, so what are we? We're globally recognized and, and engaged open ocean wave energy test facility. And again, that's very important. We're in the totally energetic uh, exposed open ocean. We're looking at surface waves, not tides, not currents. Uh, and our purpose is to provide real world full scale testing to developers, clients, researchers, so they can optimize their systems to increase energy capture, improve sur survivability and reliability. The picture that Bob showed at the very beginning shows what an inhospitable place the Oregon coast is in the wintertime. It can be terrifying. Um, these devices have to survive those kinds of conditions. They, they can't go out there and fall apart uh, for for profit reasons, for environmental reasons, for uh, shoreline communities, uh, the impacts on the shoreline communities, uh, understanding how to deploy and recover uh, and maintain these systems while they're at sea, connecting them to the grid and determining how their power conditioning works to merge with a, a, a utility grid uh, and, and to understand the economic and social benefits of doing this work. So we have these two sites, as I said before, uh, Pack Wave North, which is just off of Yaquina Head. You'll recognize this spot here north of Newport. This is a, a one mile square uh, permitted site for non cabled devices. We put uh, monitoring systems, uh, small scale wave energy test systems out, out in this area. Um, and then Pack Wave South, here's my cursor again. Pack Wave South. Um, which is a one mile by two mile rectangle that is just about due west of the, the Newport airport. It's about seven miles from the inner edge of the, of the rectangle to the nearest point on shore. 
it's well over the horizon. It would be very challenging for anyone on the beach. Well, no one on the beach could, given the curvature of the earth, see out to this site. You'd have to get up on the hill here and have some pretty good optics to be able to see these devices. And of course, this is all being developed in, in partnership with the Department of Energy. Uh, the state of Oregon has been a significant contributor, uh, as well as the local community and a number of foundations that have provided funding. So how do we do it? How do we get the power from these systems back to shore? And the answer is really simple with some huge, heavy, long cables. Uh, the cable run from the shoreside site uh, which is up here above the dune, uh, is about 20 kilometers out to the site at sea. And the cables are each capable of carrying five megawatts of power. Uh, so these are long cables. They're, uh, they're three phase, uh, what we call medium voltage, which is about 35,000 volts, uh, copper heavy cables that can, uh, that can deliver a lot of power. Uh, and we bury them, uh, tunnel them under the beach, and then bury them below the seafloor out to the test site. Uh, there will be four of these cables so that we can have four independent devices or four independent arrays of devices at each site with each, each independent cable carrying up to five megawatts of power. Uh, the cable lay operation is done by these very, very large dedicated vessels that uh, pretty much don't exist in the United States. This is an international activity uh, and they bury the cable uh, so the lower right here, they bury the cable with a device they call a jet plow. You can see the sort of skis here on the bottom. And so the ship pulls this device along the sea floor. It digs a trench with a water jet and then bury, lays the cable in that trench and buries the sand back over the cable. Uh, and so once we're done, we'll have a cable that will go as deep as 100 feet below the dune and the beach here and then be three to six feet below the sea floor until we get out to the site where we'll have these red lines rec uh, indicate the risers that will go up to be attached to the devices. Where we're boring uh, is at the Driftwood Beach, uh, oops, State Recreation Area, which is just south of Seal Rock, just north of Waldport. We started work there on Tuesday last week, so about a week ago. We closed the parking lot, uh, started to remove the asphalt, got the big drilling rigs in place. Uh, these rigs drill uh, holes under the, under the ground as deep as 100 feet. Uh, each hole is then lined with a heavy steel conduit, which we'll leave in place, and ultimately we'll pull the cable in through that conduit from the, from the cable ship at, at sea. Uh, okay, so... I'm gonna stop there for a minute. I feel like I am out of breath because I've been talking pretty fast. Hopefully folks can, could follow. I'll give you an opportunity to ask some questions about that. Uh, and then I, want, I do wanna talk a bit about uh, how we're engaged with uh, diversity and, and equity and inclusion uh, before I move on. So I will look for, I, I do lots of these Zoom meetings. I will look for hands up uh, or if folks just wanna unmute and ask questions, I'll take them. Otherwise I can move on and, and uh, we, can, we can discuss after the conclusions. even quieter than my students. I, I have a, a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Could, could you describe a little bit the environmental impact of laying those cables? Uh, yeah, so um, the, the width of the, of the trenches is, uh, you know, probably in the neighborhood of a meter or two. Uh, and so we've calculated the aerial coverage of those trenches, and it's it's very small on a percentage basis. Um, what we would be disrupting uh, by plowing up that sound and putting it back down are mostly invertebrates. Uh, we've done some estimates of the impacts on organisms like uh, Dungeness crab, uh, and anticipate that it's a small effect that will be quickly quickly dissipated once the sand is laid back down uh, over those trenches. Uh, we've got an extensive uh, commitment to monitoring, uh, which was a condition of our licensing to go back and, and survey uh, the cable routes to make sure that the cables stay buried, to make sure that they don't move around, uh, become exposed, that sort of thing. There's um, 
a number of studies that have looked at whether or not there's any electromagnetic field associated with the cables and, and all the suggestions, direct measurements and theoretical calculations suggest that it's very, very small. Uh, so we don't think it's a very large impact. You know, I think if, if an, an organism, a, you know, a whole Ethereum, uh, something like that is in the direct path of the boar, uh, they, won't be a, they won't be a happy sea cucumber. Um, but we, we don't anticipate there being a lasting effect of that uh, trenching beyond the, the act itself. Thank you, appreciate it. Sure. And I'd like to encourage um, folks to, you know, if you have a question, go ahead and ask that. Um, I'm still trying to figure out the control to get people to raise their hand. Um, uh, they should be it. able to raise independently. I thought I saw a hand go up. Oh, good. Yeah. I have a question about um, tsunamis and mm -hmm. you spoke a little bit about that. Can you elaborate on how some of these devices might be able to, to capture energy during those or dissipate energy or, you know, just. I'm Probably not, not really effectively uh, out at that depth. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the tsunami that, uh, that hit uh, Southeast Asia in the 2000s. Um, what was that one called? I, I apologize for not being able to recall that one. Um, I actually have a, a distant relative that was vacationing in that area at that time. Uh, and she was out on a dive boat uh, offshore, but not very far offshore, maybe in, you know, 50 or 60 feet of water. And they felt almost nothing. And so the thing about a tsunami is that it's very, very long but it doesn't stand up and get tall until it gets close to the shore. And so the, where these devices will be, out here is very likely to be able to capture or dissipate uh, tsunami energy at, at that level, where tsunamis raise havoc is in here when those very long waves get pushed up onto each other. And they come really, really fast. Has anyone ever done the calculation for wave speed? A tsunami moves about as fast as a 747. Outrageously fast. Thank you. Asa, thanks, Doug. 2004, December 2004. Um, yeah, and so that's, you know, protecting against a tsunami or capturing tsunami energy is not probably something that these devices can do. Um, and because they're designed to capture energy, a tsunami is such a rare uh, occurrence, almost no developer would design one to, to capture that kind of energy. Dr. Davis? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering um, how these devices are secured to the site uh, and what's, what sort of insurance that they don't break away and if they <laughs> to break away, who well, would, we're, who we're would be in, responsible for rounding them up and how would it be done? Yeah, uh, and, and I wanted to point out that uh, RJ, is that right? Uh, I, I see your hand up and I'll, I'll jump back to you next. Uh, so they're, they're anchored in fairly traditional ways. That there will be no pilings. Uh, the site depth out here is about 250 feet. Uh, there'll be no pilings, there'll be no piers. And so this will all be anchor and tether based uh, uh, retention. So typically, um, you don't want the wave energy devices to really move laterally a lot. You want them to stay more or less in one position and capture the up-down movement of the waves, maybe the, the pitching, the tilting. Um, and so there would typically be multiple tethers, um, four or, or more tethers per device, uh, and then anchors that could be uh, either just uh, displacement, just you know, big heavy things kinds of anchors or embedment anchors. We work with an anchor that's kind of pyramidal uh, and you put it on the seafloor and it doesn't really dig, it just sort of settles. And then um, you can't pull it sideways hardly at all because of the way it settles into the seafloor. Uh, and so you have sort of diagonal tethers that go out to these anchors that somewhat embed into the seafloor. Um, there are some devices that would have um, auger uh, kinds of, of screws down into the sand that you would then attach to an eye above the above the seafloor uh, but there yeah there isn't any 
you know, we, we don't have floating pontoons. We don't have, we don't have piers. We don't have uh, pilings. I had an interesting discussion with a member of the pile drivers union who wanted to know how much work we were going to produce for him. And I had to say, probably not any. Um, so it just, you know, the feasibility of pile driving in that kind of depth and those kind of, of wave states is not good. So I see a hand up from someone who's identifying as RJ Cook. You want to go yeah. ahead? Uh, hopefully I didn't miss this. Um, impacts on sea life. I'm thinking more of the larger type whales, uh, sharks. And then has there ever been any thought of as much dam removal has been happening? Is there any way to adapt this type of uh, technology into a river setting somehow? Uh, well, let me answer your second question first. Uh, and so the, the folks that are working on um, what we call run of river devices uh, are, are really focused up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. They've got a big site in the Tanana River. I don't know if any of you have been up there, uh, but it's a big, powerful river. Uh, and these are devices that effectively spin in the current, you know, much like a fishing lure. I, I, know, I'm, I know I'm simplifying with these talks about yo-yos and spinners and things, but, uh, but that's commonly how these devices work. And so rather than impounding a river, uh, and relying on, on hydrostatic uh, uh, driving, uh, driving of turbines, uh, they, they actually, devices move. Um, that wouldn't be something that would, that would be tested at PackWave. Um, there would be, you know, there are a number of reasons to put a device out here. Where's my cursor? Out here at PackWave South, even if you're not producing much energy because the test of survivability and power transmission is, is very important. And so devices that maybe were designed to work in other places could test for power uh, conditioning and transmission, but not really for power production in those, those devices. Now, when you talk about uh, effects on, on higher trophic level sea life, um, we are very sensitive to that. Uh, acoustics are a huge, acoustics monitoring and mitigation are a huge piece of what we're doing. Um, we are uh, very, very aware of the, particularly the, the gray whale cow and calf migration, which happens kind of in June, kind of happening right now, and they tend to migrate fairly close to shore. And so when we're doing the cable lay operations, uh, we will need to, in some cases, stop operations if it's, if it's suggested that noise thresholds or uh, noise threshold exceedances are coinciding with presence of animals. Once these devices are in place, uh, we don't anticipate there being a significant acoustic signature. Um, the a device that makes noise is typically a, a, a self-destructive and non, uh, non-efficient non device. Um, do you remember, uh, it was back in the late 80s during the, the sort of the first gas crunch and, and uh, the U.S. car manufacturers were pushing really hard for high fuel economy vehicles. And one of the things they were doing was just running the engines in really horrible operating conditions uh, and, and they would get good fuel economy, but they would, you know, basically blow themselves apart in the process. And these engines knocked and pinged. And, and I think it was Chrysler who called it the, the sound of savings as these engines were blowing themselves apart. Right. And so nobody, nobody out here <laughs> wants to build a device that is producing the sound of savings. They want quiet, efficient uh, capture of, of energy. Uh, and we've got, as we said, extensive requirements for persistent acoustic monitoring and uh, opportun opportunistic monitoring, monitoring so that we know about exceedance of noise thresholds very quickly. Uh, now, other devices, uh, it's not clear that sharks are as sensitive to uh, acoustics because they, that's not their communication and navigation pathway. Um, we don't think there's a significant uh, electromagnetic field effect of this based on monitoring and previous, uh, <laughs> previous measure or modeling and, and previous measurements. Um, we, do <laughs> we do think sea lions are going to crawl up on stuff. And it's been a very interesting discussion um, about how that uh, impacts uh, operations. You know, the device manufacturers don't want sea lions to crawl up on stuff because that's going to change their movement. Um, Talking with the folks in the, the Marine Mammal Service and the Fish and Wildlife, there's been this debate about whether or not having additional haul out, that's what they call these resting spaces, having additional haul out for sea lions out here uh, is detrimental to the sea lions because they'll stop swimming as far and lose fitness. They may be detrimental to the salmon because they won't have to go back into shore. Uh, 
where's my cursor go? They won't have to go back into shore, uh, you know, to rest, to haul out and, and rest up on the beach before they go back and forage again. So there are those kinds of things, but it's not really clear who the winners and losers. Are. We don't think the sea lions are going to be harmed by having devices out there. Um, this particular spot in the ocean is very flat, featureless, sandy. Uh, we think if you start putting anchors and chain down there, we think the lingcod are going to love it. There's going to be lots of, of instances of fish attraction to that infrastructure. Um, we think given the tension of these cables that there's almost no risk of entanglement of the devices, but there would be potentially a second order effect where if a crab pot got loose and came in and fouled up on it, you could have a sort of a bird's nest of, of rope around there. And those are all things that we're watching out very closely for. Great. Appreciate that. Sorry, long answer. <laughs> Linda. Oh, we've lost Linda. No, I'm here. Okay. Hi. So when you think about um, how things are going and uh, the obstacles, when do you think realistically this can be scaled up uh, to put in put in the ocean and developing, uh, giving significant um, energy? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, you know, we hope to have full-scale devices testing in the summer of 24. So that's the first answer. Now, will those first devices produce municipally significant energy? Probably not. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that is really important for you to not come away with is the idea that suddenly we're powering the coast. Even at full capacity, we might power a thousand homes on the coastline, and we probably won't be at full capacity for quite a while. The other thing to remember is that uh, energy in the Northwest, electrical energy in particular, is dirt cheap. Uh, this, the hydroelectric power system that we've got uh, is, is producing power that's at wholesale something like three and a half cents per kilowatt hour. And in order for us to even connect to the grid, which ultimately uh, connects to the larger BPA system, we cannot charge more than that wholesale rate. And so this is not, it's a great place to test. It's not a great place to make money, probably not for 20 years. And we think we're about 20 years behind wind, largely because it's so much easier to test wind than it is to test wave. Marissa. Marisa? Marissa. Marissa. Yeah, Marisa, thank you. Thank you. Um, but you answered, just answered part of my question. So yeah, going trying to connect and you have to hit the wholesale price. Because I, I was wondering when wave energy would be a significant part of our energy generation. And if when, what percentage would this wave energy be? Yeah, so that's, again, that's hard to say, uh, partly because the numbers that we have, um, you know, suggest that globally, the wave energy resource could be 10% of global demand. But we've got such a large, uh, you know, already a large hydro and wind uh, supply that even if even if we were to, you know, go to full scale here at this site, uh, you know, I think 10% would be optimistic here. 10% for a place like Kodiak, uh, a place like uh, the Central American Isthmus, where there's very strong wave uh, down, down along that spit um, that doesn't have, uh, you know, big hydro uh, resources. You know, we think it's probably much closer for a place like that than it is for a place like Oregon. What we anticipate is that we'll test the devices at Oregon that will go produce meaningful energy elsewhere. And I saw another hand up and I've lost it. All right, I've worn you down. I have that reputation. Okay, so um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I wanna point out that uh, in, in large part because of the traumatic events that, uh, that happened last year, uh, all of our uh, structural entities are very vocally and, and forward-facing in, in commitment to supporting social justice, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and you can't hardly click on a web page without finding somebody's strategic plan or commitment to diversity or statement in support of diversity and inclusion. Um, 
this is inherently a, a STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and math. And STEM fields have been traditionally uh, fairly exclusive to, to people of color. Uh, and, and so it's a forward looking, uh, hopeful uh, approach to, to try to expand that access to, to underrepresented communities. But that's very general and it's very aspirational. And, you know, we, we are just sort of, you know, I think, I, I think it's so outstanding that a Lake Oswego uh, <laughs> group is asking to talk about this because of Oregon's, you know, less than stellar history with, uh, with, with racial justice. Uh, and, and Lake Oswego certainly, uh, you know, in some cases being the poster child for, for non-acceptance. So I, I really commend you for, for doing this. But again, you know, you can have statements and you can, you can talk the talk. Uh, so what, what do we do to walk the walk? And specifically, what can Wave Energy do? And Wave Energy is so new that anything we, we talk about is, is some distance out in the future. But what I really want to focus on is this uh, clean, resilient, and independent energy source for isolated communities, which typically are, are uh, identified as being uh, uh, indigenous uh, communities of color, rural, isolated, etc., uh, and and so this is where where we think wave energy can can contribute and make a difference in in this uh, in in equity. And the example I wanted to to offer here, not that there's anything planned to happen in this area, but is Point Hope, Alaska. And I've been to Point Hope, Alaska. I was up in a research vessel uh, working up here in the Arctic, and we came in and did a, a SICOM port call here in, in, uh, in, in Point Hope. Uh, and Point Hope is actually, a, 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 it's <laughs> the Inupiaq word is, is tigigak, uh, which means basically a pointer finger because it's this point that sticks out off the, the Northern Alaskan Peninsula into the Arctic Ocean. Um, it's the ancestral home of the, and I'm gonna say this wrong, Tikigakimut, uh, uh, which is an Inupiaq tribe, uh, been there for you know thousands and thousands of years, uh, and this uh, you know stolen from stolen from Wikipedia, of course, uh, because you know this is true. But there's no way to get to Point Hope other than flying in or coming in on a boat. There are no roads that get here. Um, almost totally indigenous uh, community, and. The reason I, I made a point of this high latitude area is that effectively for, you know, three months of the year, there is no sun. And so you can't run solar here. Um, there actually is, is very little in terms of, of run of river kinds of resource here. There are rivers all over the, the North Slope, but not, not anything particularly energetic here. Uh, and so Point Hope basically relies on diesel brought in by ship to run generators to power that town through the through the Arctic night, uh, and so a place like this, where persistent even if at a low rate, uh, wave energy production of electricity could persist. Um, again, it's resilient. It doesn't depend on a vessel that might or might not be able to make it up one year after another. Uh, it can provide a number of of sort of um, emergency capabilities uh, like producing fresh water and and. Uh, and slow and steady electricity. And so this is uh, effectively where I think WAVE uh, can go is that you can produce clean energy for these isolated communities of, of indigenous native First Nations folks in ways that, that many of the other renewables can't. Uh, and so that's, that's my, my piece for that. I, I, hope that uh, I hope that met your, your expectations, Bob. And I'm... I'm done here. I've got a few slides. If uh, if folks want to ask other questions, I see a few thumbs up. That's great. Uh, and we can take some more questions if if any came up while you were waiting for me to wind down. Well, um, I uh, you know we could go. Do you have some more slides you want to show, uh, Dr. Hicks? Oh, they're they're just uh, you know they're things that are in my hip pocket. Uh, you know, architects' <laughs> renderings of our our shoreside facility where we do the power uh, conversion and and uh, uh, merging with the with the CLPUD grid. Um, what else do I have here? Uh, 
sort of more history. This is a, a site up in the Orkney Islands uh, in Scotland, which has the only other comparable site uh, in the world. Uh, they're a partner of ours. This is that device, the, they called it the Wello Penguin that had the asymmetric flywheel that uh, builds up a, a resonance here. They didn't pick a particularly energetic day for the picture, uh, but <laughs> it is still making some, making some energy here. Uh, yeah, so that's... Well, uh, I think we need to give you a virtual uh, <laughs> applause. <laughs> you can, uh, it's been extremely enlightening and exciting to think that Oregon, uh, our little state is on a real cutting edge uh, of an international uh, research development. And, uh, and, and I so, and so appreciative of your, you must be a very busy guy that the <laughs> construction has just started. Yeah, things and, are very busy uh, right now, for sure. Many balls uh, at this time. So to come and talk to our little group is, is very kind of you to do. And, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have our, our foundation officer here and I should point out, you know, that this is a, a big and expensive project. Um, uh, with almost all of the money coming from uh, the Department of Energy, but not not all of it and not quite enough. And so we are, you know, we're sort of actively engaging community and in involvement in, in supporting us in, you know, sort of in any way. Uh, and Doug, I don't know if you want to unmute and, and make your pitch for the, <laughs> the OSU fundraising drive uh, here, but uh, you know, if if this is of interest to you, if you know of folks who might be interested in this, uh, please please get them in touch with Doug Brusa uh, at at the OSU Foundation. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Burke. I've I've been lurking. Uh, Doug Brusa. I work with uh, I work with Burke on the funding aspects of this, and foundations, some that you know of, uh, as well as individuals in Oregon have contributed. And we're not here to ask for money. Just want you to know that that is part of uh, what's paying for this. Yeah, but we Thank wouldn't you. say no, right? <laughs> we would not say no to anyone. And there's a donate now button on the website. Yeah, I yeah. think that uh, you. Uh, that for those people who had, hadn't read about this, this is uh, the, this is an eighty million dollar project. So uh, this is no small potatoes. No. Uh, and. Uh, and so it was a, a, a great uh, triumph for Oregon State to be able to pull down this big grant and uh, support their uh, yeah, program. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and we hope, uh, despite the fact that a number of these act construction activities are dependent on an international community, we, we hope that a lot of this construction money comes right back into the coastal economy. We think that uh, almost all of, of this construction here on the terrestrial facility will be local. Uh, the work that's being done with the underground drilling is local companies, uh, and so we're we're you know excited to bring that those those funds from DOE you know back home to Oregon. Well, maybe with that, then uh, we will call it an evening. And uh, thanks again. And uh, uh, we will be uh, you know sending out a little uh, email to all the registrants with some uh, material for follow-up and uh, just to let people know we we have a, had a monthly forum uh, LOSN but uh, we're going to skip the month of uh, July and we're still working on our August forum we're not quite sure uh, how it's going to, what it's going to be for sure I think that's correct Mary is that yeah. well, we have we have a topic but we we still need to reach out um, we've reached out to a speaker but need to have them back from vacation Okay, uh, so uh, with that, then uh, we'll close the meeting and say thank you for all of you uh, for coming and showing your interest in this. I realize that these are not, it's not a topic that affects your everyday life, but uh, uh, to me anyway, and I hope to you, it's, it's fascinating and, uh, and gives us some vision for the future. So well, thanks again all for inviting us and uh, have a great evening and a, and a great time. Very summer. interesting work. Thank you. You bet. <laughs> Bye-bye.